Okay, so a hey, good afternoon all. We are going into chapter five of our, of our geocomputation with R book club. As you can see, um, after the previous week, we where we looked at the spatial data operations, we're now looking at a category of things that we could do called geometry operations. To somewhat summarize what we're gonna look at today, we could down sample vector data and or a bunch of different things that we could do with vector data. We're gonna gain an overview of various geometry operations for that vector data. And then because we can, we could also briefly look at raster data and some of the calculations there, uh, mostly downsampling and upsampling. We'll continue using the special features package, but also maybe play around with some spatial data packages as well, along with the relatively new Terra package. Now, I'll fully admit in the first two thirds of the examples, I'm much more comfortable with ggplot than with base R graphics. So I use ggplot my examples. Out of an old habit, I loaded the tidyverse, which fortunately when I did the GitHub push, our facilitator and host um, went ahead and helped me finish that and loaded the entire tidyverse as well on the GitHub side. But if we moving forward feel that we want a little bit more precision, I could have put library ggplot here. And also there may be a few typos here and there. If there are anything you want to revise, just message me in the Slack channel. All right, so for vector data, as we've been seeing for the previous few chapters, we will be ex today exploring the geometry aspects of the data. And as we do calculations, we recall that we have special features of data types along with the special features coordinates when we want to focus on just the geometry column. So to get us started with a setting, we have La Seine, a river in France. And again, I prefer to graph these things in ggplot. And here's what our information looks like at the beginning. Now, if we have larger data sets and we're just maybe practicing some calculations or just getting started on a workflow, we might want to simplify the data set so that it's smaller in size. One of the ways to do that is with the st simplify command. And suppose that we wanted to reduce the information down to the nearest kilometer, a resolution of a thousand meters. So I did that here. Otherwise, ran virtually the same ggplot code. And we have this picture here. The idea is as we change the resolution going down to 2,000 meters. 4,000 meters, and then 8,000 meters, we have to worry about, of course, the balance between what we visually think as quality versus the information that we need to use that could affect our computation time and what we're trying to get out of this. We could also then see if we use the object size command on these various data sets, the, the original data, one kilometer, two kilometers, et cetera, the size of the data set does decrease, but maybe not as quickly as we would hope for. The SEN data set is our line type of data. We could also apply the same train of thought to polygons. So here we have a data set of the continental United States in a particular coordinate reference system. And this is the original data that we're looking at. Okay. 
Similarly, if we use or try out the st simplify command down to the one kilometer of uh, resolution, we in a space like this with a computer screen or maybe think of social media, this picture probably visually looks almost the same as the original. But as we change the resolution, here it is at 10 kilometers, people who stare at this map quite often could start to notice some differences between this and the original. And then once we change the resolution down to 100 kilometers, this gets comically distorted. So once again, we could look at the object size of the graphs that, or the data sets I produced above. And while the data set gets cut down by about a factor of two, we could argue that maybe having a situation like this is not something that we would want. Also, the textbook mentions that there is another package out there called Smoother. And when you do these simplify mechanisms, these are various algorithms that have been produced in the geocomputational fields over the years. And you could try out different algorithms to maybe see if for your data, these work better for you in some sense. Uh, to the audience, you notice on the left that in we are going through kind of a tour of various functions. But if there's any moment you want to uh, stop and talk more about something, feel free to let me know. Yeah, I'm adding in the chat the link for Map Shapers, which is like um, I think it's a JavaScript library at the beginning, and this is like the welcome the MS Simplify function, uh, and you can experiment with it like. Uh, it have also, it have like um, so map shaper was produced I think by a journalist from um, I don't remember a big a big uh, newspapers uh, in America I don't remember which one someone remember and uh, you have like a, a web uh, interface so you can also use it on the web or you can also use it at the command line if needed and then you have a package uh, air map shapers. That's also like provide a bunch of this like MS Simplify and other um, transformation from uh, spatial data. It's very handy if you do some stuff on the web. So that's it. <laughs> you can search. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Yeah, it's it's a very good tool and uh, the lot of time uh, when I want to convert some some stuff, uh, I just go like the. Uh, you can, it's also like quick import, quick export, uh, KML and stuff like that. So sometimes it's useful. The web uh, editors is great. That's it. Go ahead. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I believe some of these algorithms do have an extra parameter to play around with, which if say, for example, you're coming from machine learning, you realize the notion of tuning your parameters takes up a lot of your work time. All right, so let's move on to the notion of centroids. We are trying to identify the center of geographic objects. Now, analogous to statistics of, of say, the mean, median, and mode, there are different ways to calculate centroids, but in going through this textbook, maybe we'll put wait for that in chapter 11. For now, we'll look at the New Zealand uh, shapefile, because as folks in this audience would know, that's where R was born. So it's good to give them a nice callback. And in this particular file, we see that, especially in the geom column, we have a multi-polygon type. For practice, there are also some demographics info 
information as well. But because we have polygons here, if there was ever an application where we needed just a certain one location per region, we would need to do an extra calculation, namely the centroid. So as you can imagine, nice helper function was developed uh, over the years, ST centroid. And visually what I've done is simply add those as a ggplot layer with red dots for now. For the most part, I'm happy with how this turned out for the New Zealand regions, but perhaps if there is an example where a region has a horseshoe or U shape, the centroid might not even be inside the land or the original region itself. So that's why you might want a more complicated or more complex calculation. And while I was here, I decided to also give us a quick application of the centroids. If you use the SF version of the label layer, telling the software where to put the labels uh, is useful at times. Admittedly, this graph is kind of ugly at the moment, but it's, just, it's a nice starter situation. We, we use that sun trade on the first chapter, I think. I don't know if you remember. Um, on the two, I think it was like for the coffee example, we use it like the country places to put the sun trade and then like have an X uh, of the side of the sun trade. So the sun trade can also be uh, used like to make some map. Like the example on label is a good one. And I think like on the first chapter, we use it like. Um, if I remember uh, first or second chapter, uh, I think it was the second, we use it like the centroid to put a dot on every country and then have the dot increase uh, with a quantitative variable. And in the chat, like I share like an example of Deception Island. I don't know if you know about it. It was like an island uh, that was like uh, famous for like uh, well uh, hunting, badly famous. And if you look at the, the shape of it, you will, uh, a bit below, you will say, yeah, if you calculate the centroid without specifying it, the centroid will be on the C. So it's it's a fun toy example, I will say. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. Yes. I, I think centroid have an option, an argument that uh, you can fill, I will check, and you can ask for, enforce it to be on the shape, if I remember correctly. I will I will search for it, but go. Go ahead. If this case happened. <laughs> All right. Um, and then our next toy would be buffers. We'll go back to the line data for La Sun. And suppose maybe you're working in hydrology or maybe some environmental context and you need to know where on in this landmass we are close to the rivers. We have a convenient ST buffer command. Maybe we'll start off with a distance of five kilometers from the water. And this is where our picture starts to look like. So as you can see, a buffer provides the highlight of the area around whatever shape file or data we are concerned about. I also went ahead and produced another example with a buffer of 50 kilometers so that we could compare and contrast. Now, looking through the help file of the ST buffer command, there are ways to adjust how the buffer itself is made for so, uh, some sort of proportions or percentages. However, if you're worried about computational time and making a buffer for a much larger data set, you might have to downsample the original data first and then make the buffer if that's what your concern is, rather than messing with the parameters of ST buffer itself.
From here, the textbook goes into things called affine transformations. It kind of bugs me as a math teacher because for me, affine means something slightly different, but I'll just go with what's presented in front of us. A lot well, of what's going to happen is, as was presented a couple of weeks ago, we're going to actually focus on the geometry column and do some calculations just on that. So we need to extract just that column at times. What I did was take the New Zealand map and move everything to the, to the east by 10 kilometers and to the north by 10 kilometers. And because I'm so used to ggplot, I had to put everything back together with the same coordinate system and type just in case. So we have a shift. Again, the gray is the original. Move it over to the east by 10 kilometers. Move it up north by 10 kilometers. And the after version is there in blue. While I was here, I decided to geek out with this instead of just making one image. What if I just made many images? And I think this might slightly better represent what we mean by shifting. There was one more thing I wanted to do with this map, but didn't quite get there yet. It is nice. So then we could now think about rescaling. Again, focus on the geometry columns. Oh, and I'm, I'm not going to dive too deeply into the mathematics of it all, but in order to rescale, we need to know where the center of each region is. So we'll once again use the centroids. There's a nice uh, for formula implemented. And whatever you want to rescale and factor to be, say in this case, uh, 50%, you would put that there. Once again, I was playing around with this via ggplot, so I had to double check the data type and CRS. The original is in gray. And if I took each region of New Zealand and rescaled it by a fact down by a factor of two or rescaled by multiplying by 50%, that's what we get there in red. We had to keep everything in place by using their centroids. And once again, I kind of geeked out on this. So that's what we mean by scaling. One more affine transformation, rotations. We we'll need to give this an axis that will be on the centroids. For those of us who have taken linear algebra before, realize that there is a two by two rotation matrix that we can apply to latitude and longitude data. Long story short, in the mathematics, we could apply a rotation the function is written for degrees instead of radians, ensuring the type in CRS. And this picture, as the book recommended, is if we took every region in New Zealand and rotated it clockwise by 30 degrees. Now, if I was new to this field, I might not understand what's going on here. And this is why I wanted things to be animated. So that way it's a little bit more obvious what we mean by rotation. I never have used of this. <laughs> and yeah. as you pointed out in chat, instead of centroids, uh, again, yeah. we needed to make sure that the axis is indeed inside the area. There are other functions such as point on surface. Okay, so for this group, admittedly, I spent a lot of time on the on the uh, animations and for the rest of the sections, I did not spend as much time. So we'll see how this turns out. There's a broad notion called quipping. Intersection is probably our most common application of it. So we'll look at that one first. 
in similar to math logic, we could seek out the intersection. This is probably easier to see in the picture itself. So the original version of New Zealand, I have in red. Once again, for the version in blue, I moved it to the east by 10 kilometers and to the north by 10 kilometers. And thus, it, the red and blue regions just happen to overlap in some areas. By using the ST intersection command, I simply declared that the red and blue make purple, and thus the purple regions are the highlights of where they happen to intersect. Now, we could do this in many different ways. And as a math teacher of probability, I am looking to actually use this more often. I just did not do it now. But as far as the logic is concerned, represented by these Venn diagrams, you could see that there are different ways you could carry out your logical calculations, depending on what you're trying to do. This image itself comes from the R4 data science book by Grohlman and Wickham. Maybe, Next week. Maybe okay. one point which is maybe a bit different. I don't know if it's a bit different, but it was mentioning. If you check the ST union, uh, you will have like uh, dissolving the boundary. I think if I'm correct. Hmm. So you have X and Y, and now the boundary are dissolved. So you just have like, uh, as you see, like uh, you will, uh, uh, yeah, you are dissolving the boundary in the uh, while unionized, which is, um, I think this is the same term in classical GIS. Like, yeah, if you had like, like let's say like a black colors, you will not have like, a, um, the boundary uh, between uh, X and Y disappear. It just, you are removing the vertex. I don't know if it's clear. This is just a point to notice because sometimes it's, uh, if you do in some other one, uh, you will not dissolve the boundary. So you will still have uh, the boundary between the two. I mean, you still have like boundary line. So yeah, like uh, SF uh, make the choice that's removing it. Yes, thank you. That's good to know. And if I recall correctly, you all last week had a good discussion about maybe some distinctions between binding boundaries, exterior. Yeah. Very subtle this, differences. This is like a small difference. Yeah, you need to know, but uh, yeah, just be careful when you are doing it. Just check the results. That's it. Mm -hmm. but, go ahead. Okay, so now for the example about geometry unions and how what that means in the context of maybe more geometrical thought, we have the again the data set about the continental United States, but this one came with a notion that there are separate regions in the United States. So we could use a little bit of D prior and take those regions and total the population from the year 2015. When I was making these notes, I decided to leave the warnings in because when we do some of these operations, we assume that the data applies to the entire region, which might not be true. And it's kind of nice that our studio warns us about this. Oh, and this one's more about longitude and latitude. So for the original data set, just a very um, quick ggplot, we have our year 2015 population, the states that do not have as many people, I gave them kind of an orange color, the states that have many more people, I gave them a greenish color and a gradient color scheme from there. As you know, the states of New York, Texas, and California have more people and are represented as such. However, with business enterprises, you might think of the country in terms of regions, so this data set breaks up the continental United States into four regions, West, Midwest, Northeast, and the South. And this, in this point of view, when you uh, combine things into what is in our context called a geometry union, 
you see that the region in the bottom right, the American South from Texas to Delaware, actually en encompasses the most people as far as these four um, regions are concerned. And as we see, like Union dissolve the boundary and add it. Like if you check, like it dissolved the boundary of the state to create a new regions where it decided to sum it. Uh, it's an hyster like it's uh, something like uh, I don't know how you deal about it, but for population it makes sense. Uh, but if you deal with uh, because you can easily add people. People are, are stuff that sum easily, but sometimes you have variables that does not sum easily. Uh, it makes sense to, I mean, you are changing uh, what sometimes people call the support of the information by taking like a new uh, data with a new support. And sometimes the, sh the information is relative to the support of the disinformation. Um, I don't have an example here, but let's say like, for example, it's especially relevant where you are doing dealing with like, um, let's say some correlation. If you have instead of people, and instead you have a correlation, some some correlation, let's say like the presence of Waffle House by state and then um, divorce rates. I'm taking a bullshit um, correlation. If you add this correlation, I do not think it will make sense. So it will, uh, you will, add, you can, you can add and divide and get a correlation. It's just math, but the numbers does not make sense. If you have like let's say a correlation of one plus a correlation of five plus a correlation of six, and you you add all of that and you divide by three, it will give you a correlation, but that's uh, it's it may be like not correct. So this is something like to be careful when you are dealing with it, I feel. And a lot of error I see in the field is when people like uh, are modifying the support of information without taking uh, into case like, oh, it changed. I don't know if you, if others like have experience of that, but uh, I, this is an error. I mean, it's a, uh, the academic term is a modifiable, modifiable RL unit problem, the MOOP uh and it's yeah, everywhere so this is something like to be aware of and just be careful i don't know do others like have trouble with it i will i will put a link on the wiki of it it was bad yes, uh, thank you it sounds like um, what we statistics teachers call in a slightly different setting called simpson's paradox where we do yeah, if we have be. correlations for separate groups but if we bring them together as with the image we see in front of us, the correlations may change. It may even reverse positive, negative, or vice versa. So yeah, I'll just mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the mo the the mop problem, and uh, I guess sometimes yes, yeah, Simpson paradox could be like related to it. Uh, you can like gen check like the paper from Open Show is from 1983, if I remember correctly, and it's still an ongoing problem. So. <laughs> in the yeah indeed so just it just uh, like a lot of cases like it just um the good way of doing it is just being careful okay as we move through the rest of the chapter this is arguably now going to be the more complicated material but uh, we're here in this book club to really be careful with the data types and have a deep understanding of what we're trying to do. So we probably should spend some time talking about type transformations. The example we start off with, let me zoom out a bit. The example we start off with is a multi-point um, data type. Here we have a three by two matrix actually. And admittedly, I'm still used to ggplot, so I graph things that way, but you could simply do plot multi-point at this point if you want to use the base R ubiquitous command. And there we have our three dots. If for some reason we want to take that multi-point object and recast it as a line string object, we could use our helper function stcast. 
And at the moment, this operation will connect the dots in some way as prescribed. Likewise, if we take that original multipoint, the three dots, cast it as a polygon, it will connect the dots in some way, and also for visualization purposes, will include the middle as far as how we think about it. It will shade the, the, the region. We could also go backwards, at, at least for these particular examples, if we take that line string, this image here, pass it back up to a multipoint, or if we take that polygon, this gray triangle, pass it back up to a multipoint, the results that we get will indeed be equivalent to each other. Now, as you all were talking, at length over the past couple of weeks, past couple of chapters, there are subtleties between the various data types that we encounter. Some can be cast in, from one to the other. This table, it would help us understand that, but admittedly, I didn't spend much time here. Does anybody else want to talk more about typecasting or offer some wisdom while we're here? Well, I can always say something, but <laughs> like the philosophy of SF, if I'm correct, is like you typecast from the closest, let's say you, it will be that it will be like, um, so people disagree with that, but I, I do not know like what's the correct way of doing it. Let's say you have a multi-polygon and you want points. Should we cast multi-polygon for polygon, send polygon to points? Or should you should the software do it directly for you? So this is like I do not remember or uh, SF deal with that. I think SF deal with that sequentially. So let's say like you have a a point, uh, multiple point, and you want a length string. This this operation are easy. But when you are adding multi, should we divide it into length string, then divide it to point, or should it divide it directly to point? So uh, you have various pathway to consider. And I do not remember exactly uh, what SF does, but I think like people usually, I mean, there are people who think like there's another, I mean, there are better ways than others. I do not know. Just remember like to check, like sometimes maybe you want to go fast and maybe I do not remember if SF allow you to go fast, but going straight to multi-line to uh, line uh, without, uh, or to point without going by line. So this is like uh, one point like to consider. I do not remember exactly how it works in SF, but I know it's it's some um, like, yeah, it could be like tricky. So just just be careful on thinking, like keep keep in mind the process that you are doing. I think this is my advice. Uh, but because sometimes you want to do that. Okay. Thank you. And if someone remember or or SF deal with it, like feel free to, to, to say it. We have a nice tour example of how this typecasting or changing of the types might be helpful. We have a object here called multi-line string, which at the moment I just want to emphasize is one object with that geom. And visually we have this object here. We could plainly see on one way or the other, this was constructed out of three lines. So we could instead cast this back down to a line string object where we have the th th three line strings now appearing as part of the geom. That might be useful in your data collection depending on who you're working with. Now that you have uh, three different objects, maybe you have a data collector coming in and saying we have labels for example, if these are streets, let's give them street names. And each street has a length in, say, kilometers, so that we could get those in our data frame sense. And then finishing off that train of thought, I went ahead and graphed all that. 
four or three streets. These sections from chapter five, from five, um, from what our slides call 5.1 to 5.11, were for 5.12, were for vector data. So let's go ahead and move into a bit about raster data. Of course, rasters, from my math teacher viewpoint, are matrices where the cells each have the same size, and you only have to really keep track of the corner of the raster when you talk about location. The rasters themselves might have information such as elevation, rainfall totals, or some other value as well. In general, the geometric raster operations include shifting, flipping, mirroring, scaling, rotation, warping, something there of stuff that you could probably do to a matrix representation, but we just happen to be here in a geocomputation setting. There are a variety of applications and a textbook um, spent a little bit of time talking about georeferencing. While a software program like this in R might be good for some of the calculations, it might still be the case that the people who do work actually adding data to the data set or describing information, they might prefer to still use a GIS program such as QGIS or ArcGIS. So we're going to play around with a raster here coming from a TIFF file. It has some extent and a simple raster. At this point, I, I just found it easier to use the base R graphics. The simple raster looks like this at the moment. We have a six by six matrix with some values talking about elevation in between or for each cell. Now, if you wanted to extend the raster in the area sense, what this code does with the parameters one and two, it adds one row to the top and the bottom. It adds two columns to the left and the right. And by default, the added information or added placements, the value is listed as NA at the moment. Now, if you're trying to do some raster arithmetic, such as adding rainfall totals from a couple of consecutive years, well, like in mathematical matrices, adding these two rasters does not make sense. So if you try to just add those two, that will produce an error. But nevertheless, if that is your intention, there are ways to then work around it, uh, kind of like when you're computing an average and working around missing values you could use the extend command and try to finish off your raster calculations that way. Recall that the origin of a raster is the cell that's labeled closest to the coordinate zero, zero. Each of these rasters that were made in the previous slide will still have that same origin. But if you do need some offset, you can change the origin using our usual calculations. I have a hunch all of us in this group have worked with rasters before, and these could be quite large you know, data files, and it could take quite a long time to load and do calculations at, at first. So it's useful for people studying this to know how to aggregate and disaggregate data just to give ourselves situations that are more manageable um, to start off with. If we have the raster, this digital elevation model, we could aggregate this by, sorry, I'm probably mixing up some of my words here by a factor of five, looking at groups of cells and computing some statistics, such as a mean, median, or sum. And the original 
digital elevation model um, is this first picture here. The digital the color scheme annoys me because the greens are actually the higher elevation, the browns are the lower elevations in this picture. So we're kind of implying a mountain in the top left, a valley in the bottom right. Aggregation means in some sense we have fewer cells to think about, but we still want some values in those cells that still summarizes what's going on in the nearest neighbors in some sense. So we can still see green cells here in the top left, brownish cells in the bottom right, but perhaps we don't want our computer to have to spend a lot of time doing these calculations. So we would have to use this simple uh, data set here in the aggregation. In image processing, this, proce this process I believe would be called downsampling. There is an inverse called disaggregation. You could have a scaling factor as usual, but because what disaggregation will do will take a cell and split it up in some way, but hopefully the image or information that you get is still smooth in some sense. There are different algorithms to do so. The default is called near. There, are, there is another algorithm called bilinear. And we get this picture here. That is from start to finish. We had this original picture, aggregated it down to this picture, and then upgrade, upscaled it back up to this picture. However, we need to caution ourselves that there could be a loss in translation. Say, for example, if you took a poem in English words, ran it through a language translator to say French, and then took the French version of that, ran it through the translator back to English, what you started and stopped with might not be the same thing. The calculations for rasters have a similar feel, and the textbook authors noted that caution that if we did that aggregation and disaggregation, we are not left with the same product. So then finally, this chapter ends by talking a bit about resampling. Uh, I say a bit about resampling because I have a hunch that future chapters will have more information as well. The idea is what to do when we have two or more rasters, but maybe they come from different data sources. So they have different resolutions, they have different origins. You might have to compute values for new pixel locations and thus somewhere along the way, you have to resample and make an educated guess for the values of the raster. Over the years in the geocomputational fields, there have been many great papers about this producing different recommended methods, nearest neighbor, bilinear, cubic interp, cubic splines. Um, I'm guessing this is called Lance Coast. All of these are probably popular enough to be used in practice uh, fairly often. The issue is that some of the algorithms are easier in some sense, and they run faster in your computer computation time. Some of the algorithms are made to make a picture or a result that is smoother in some sense. Um, when I say smoother, I'm actually thinking almost about calculus and derivatives and slopes. So the underlying math that goes into these become more and more complicated, but they might produce results that are arguably better and better, and that's the trade-off. So we have a balance between quality and computational time. Here we have a target raster that's made a different resolution and a different projection or coordinate reference system than our DEM, our digital elevation model. But once again, our DEM was this, the mountain in the left, the valley in the bottom right. And if we wanted to resample with the target raster, uh, these days we might, might as well go ahead and adopt the relatively new Terra package to do so. It has a parameter that where the user could request the different algorithms. 
And these pictures are what happens when we have the different algorithms running. These are toy examples. So on my computer, each one of these resamplings took about less than one second to compute. But I imagine for real world or practical data sets, these can take quite a while, maybe on the order of an hour to compute. All right, folks, so that brings us to the end of my presentation of chapter five. Um, what do you want to talk about? I can just add quickly, like, uh, usually use nearest neighbor when you have categorical value. Because you're like, uh, you have like uh, some digital elevation model or something like metric that makes sense to add and, and subtract. But sometimes uh, you just have categorical value, then you will take the nearest uh, neighbor's value. Like uh, if you have like, let's say, I don't know, some category of soils, uh, you can use like, uh, then what is recommended, it's near neighbors. And the trick of them is like the generate information. Uh, when you don't sample, you are losing information, but that's still, let's say the information. When you up sample, uh, when you like, you are basically using a model to add information. So it's depend of your model, <laughs> uh, which is uh, powerful and dangerous. But uh, yeah, that's it. That's a trade off to consider. No, this is why you are. So some people pay you, but yeah, great presentation and nothing to say. I think. Um, it was like good to mention the categorical versus maybe numerical values, because with numerical values, you would be concerned about the quote unquote slope between adjacent cells and you don't want them to be too bad slope wise especially if you're talking about literally elevation here so that's why you might want to opt for a more intense procedure such as cubic points yeah so this, this is like where well, like you you start to 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 do more let's say even if they are hide it, there's still a model and you have to pick the models that are correct with the data and your assumption and your hypothesis, uh, your knowledge of the the area, the field, whatever you are using. So yeah, it was a great presentation. Uh, we do not have no one for next week. Does someone want to volunteer? Or is it back to me? Next. Well, I guess it can be, if no one wants, it can be my time, I guess. Uh, it's it's can be a quick chapter, so maybe we can, I can save time for doing exercise or other stuff. So I will put myself, except if someone wants. And we're good. No, it was a great presentation. Uh, yeah, I know sometimes like this stuff seems like, you know, very narrow cases, like casting stuff. But in real analysis, I have done plenty of my share. Like you get data in some particular form. So it's not necessarily makes sense. <laughs> and this happened a lot. And then you need to transform where it makes sense. And so casting, uh, yeah, it's, it's useful a lot of time. Uh... Yes, yeah, on trade, buffers, every, every, every of this operation, you are like basically using it all the time. So, and they are super easy, I think, uh, to understand. And you make a very good uh, animation and very clear example of them. So, yeah. Does this is like have anything to say? Uh, let me think. I had a question. I don't know sure. if I can. Ask it. Like for, for example, when you cast from points to lines, is there a way to uh I don't know, like tell the algorithm like do it in one direction? Like uh, that's a good question. I haven't done it recently. I think you can order them in some way by another variable. Uh, let's let's check it. I can like let's see. Uh, let's Google it or ask ChatGPT STCast. Uh, 
um, line order line to points. No order point to line. Yeah, I agree. For those of us like myself who treat this kind of as a hobby, we just kind of trust that the people who make those country shape files had those dots in order. <laughs> yeah, they usually like also like uh, there is an issue on GitHub. Uh, Apparently, you can. Uh, it's not clear. Let me see. I do not see. Example. I will have to try. Like uh, it's. Uh, I will go directly. Like. Uh, to ST cast uh, in the GitHub repo and see the code if it's shorter. ST cast. Uh, uh, uh. This is test. This is the test. The cast error. So if someone wants to check at the same time, I can copy the code. I mean the the link to the repo. This is the good point of open source. You can pick. <laughs> oh, it's down. I don't know. This is test. This is still a test. So it's not the actual function. So where is the actual function? I, I passed the wrong one. Where is it? Uh, here. I think, is it here? Yeah, it's here. The second link. So behind the scenes, like if you use value subject, you have like stcast have like a method that's specific for various subjects. So you have one method for multi polygon, one multi for multi string, one multi for multi point. Let's go from one that's light string. And they are calling, it will be difficult because they are calling functions themselves. It will be hard to read. Let's see which one could be. Oh, they haven't some for compound curve. That's still, I guess, will still will be implemented one day. I don't see it does that. Well, I guess it will be a question for letters. Uh, okay. Multi no, I want points. Where is no, I want lint string. So to produce line string for multi polygon, it's just in class. Yeah, it's unclear for me. My idea is we should ask. <laughs> I will ask on the Discord and see um, how does it works. I do not remember exactly. Because uh, we want to cast line string for point. It just draw as it just draw as the point of objects uh, from it. So so I guess you have multi point and you want light string. It used tell like I can share the link. I think this is here. Uh, let me uh, where is it? Yes, here. OK, 
the line. So uh, from what I guess, it does not use another value. It just use like ST multi point. I have to check what tail one is doing. And then it take like the, the first uh, numbers of tail one. So I guess they order it and they put it into an orders. This is what tell should do, but I'm not sure. I have to check what tell is doing, tell one is doing. Never use it. And class is just to remove the, the type. And but good question. And so unlike what I said, like it does not use uh at least on F F SFC. It does, you can't like, let's say, add an order and uh, enforce it to use the order you provide it because uh, it does not appear in this function, at least. So I don't know. I will ask and report back. Okay, or you great. can ask also. Yeah, thanks. But yeah, I, I imagine like it's, uh, if you work with uh, movement data, no? Are you working with uh, movement data? Uh well, I had this problem like working with a polygon and wanted to transform it to a single line to draw a map with international yeah. borders. And I was getting like strange triangles. Yeah, over. yeah. This is this is a good question. Uh, I think it's a, uh, people that's research on, uh, you know, movement, uh, usually like they have the time frame. So they know like this point. <laughs> And I, I, I'm curious how they, they solve this issue because for them it's it's important. And uh, so I will ask, or you can ask as you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will ask also. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Other people have question, interesting question like that. Oh, good discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Well, bye everyone. Good. Good See you all. Bye bye. See you. Was a great presentation. <laughs> yes, thank Thanks. You. Bye. Yeah, Derek. Thanks a lot.